Can everyone hear me? Oh, that's so loud. <laughs> Welcome to the Finding Common Ground to EK Logical Restoration Partnership session. Um, I am not a speaker, I'm the moderator, but I'm here to introduce your three speakers. So first, just gonna introduce some concepts will be Christina Eisenberg, the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence, Maybell Clark, McDonald Director of Tribal Initiatives and Natural Resources at the Oregon State University College of Forestry. And here with her to speak as well are her PhD students. First is Allison Monroe, a NSF fellow, and Tessa Chisonis, another PhD student. Um, so we're gonna have them speak on their presentations and then we'll hold our questions until the end and we'll do a large Q&A session where I will run microphones to any questions in the audience and have them answer. So without any further ado, here's Christina. Thank you everyone, thank you for attending. Um, you see the title of our panel and since I submitted the abstract, um, the, the formal, the official term for um, the knowledge that is held by uh, indigenous peoples is now called indigenous knowledge, IK. And that's per the White House OSGP CEQ and presidential memoranda. So things are shifting really fast for working with tribal nations and how one does that, how one partners with tribal nations ethically. So let's get started. I'm gonna take a, you on a journey. Hello, my name is Mountain Star Woman. I'm gonna start with this decolonized land acknowledgement. I'm committed to taking people and the institutions with whom we work beyond the land acknowledgement to find ways to support and empower Native Americans and their communities. I gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we are gathered, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. I acknowledge that the ancestors have recognized Virginia tribes who have lovingly stewarded these lands for millennia, including the Rappahannock, uh, Munki, Upper Metapone, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Ransomond, Monacan, Matapone, Patawomek, and Notaway were forcibly removed from these lands. I value the long and deep interactions they have with the land and aspire to find ways to honor and manifest that value in my work and life and help heal the damage done by settler colonialism. And that's an image, it's um, a piece of art, historical art, of um, the process of colonization. So the contact between the Euro-American settlers and the tribal nations that um, were here at the point of contact. Some of you attended the workshops that um, Tessa, Allison, and I ha held yesterday. So some of this is going to be a little bit repetitive, just these first few slides, but it's important that we define terms so that we all understand clearly what we're talking about and that, that then informs the partnerships that we build. The terms that I'm providing, um, pretty much all of them are actually uh, legal policy terms now because they have to do with partnering with tribal nations. So indigenous knowledge, IK, uh, formerly known as traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, is a seventh generation approach. That means that actions you take today should lead to a sustainable future at least seven generations into the future. It's defined by Robin Wall Kimmer, and I like to use, uh, my preference is to define this term uh, in the words of indigenous people, not by non-indigenous scholars who have been studying our cultures. So Robin Wall Kimmer defines it as knowledge and practices passed orally from generation to generation informed by strong cultural memories, sensitivity to change, and values that include reciprocity. And that is really a key word that defines 
how we interact with each other and with the world as Native people. Rooted in spiritual health, culture, and language, TEK is a way of life. So you heard speakers this morning, Tom Kay, Tracy Stone Manning, um, Alexis, talk about how we're in trouble right now because of climate change and the earth as we know it is changing rapidly and plant communities are some of the first signs that we see are these shifts in plant communities. I am on the board of Ecolo the Society for Ecological Restoration. I've served on that board for quite a few years now. And um, I was one of the co-authors of the principles and practices for ecological restoration by Gann et al. And I helped with this section on uh, indigenous knowledge. So ecological restoration is defined as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Ecocultural restoration, also defined by Robin Wall Kimmer, is the process of restoring key pre-contact aspects of that system. So before your American settlers came in the United States, what is today the United States, the landscape looked very different than it does today. There were practices such as cultural burning that were being used to keep forests open, uh, help grasslands thrive and improve habitat for all kinds of wildlife and foods for humans as well. So uh, eco-cultural restoration is looking to the past for answers that can help us into the future. So indigenous knowledge and the national seed strategy equals eco-cultural restoration. And that's what we're gonna be sharing some stories about that with you. And, but why? Why does it matter so much right now? Well, because a lot of these landscapes and the plants that they contain have been damaged by practices that people brought from Europe, um, thinking that you know they made good sense. And there's a lot that we don't know. And we're learning. And, and in this stage in our learning process, and climate change has made it a pretty urgent learning process, we've learned that these practices and even the best Western science don't really work to give us the insights that we need to develop solutions to create those resilient plant communities, for example. And so we look to indigenous knowledge because it's ancient knowledge, it's you know millennia old. And as an example of the role of seeds in this indigenous knowledge, here is a, a piece of art. This is one of Robin Wall Kimmer's, I think it hangs on her office wall. It's a sky woman falling to the earth, and I am not allowed to tell the story because we do not tell the cultural stories of other indigenous communities. That is how we show respect, even if we're native. But in this case, um, she, it, it's a creation story, and she fell to earth from the beings up in the sky and she clutched in her hand a fistful of sacred seeds of, of the special plants. And those plants, that was their top priority. The creator's top priority is let's bring those plants onto the earth so that everyone can have what they need. And so that is what seeds need, mean to native people. Indigenous science and Western science partnerships are referred to as two-eyed seeing. This is a Canadian concept that arose about a decade ago, um, having to do with human health and education, and it's now being applied to ecology. And it is a uh, systems thinking approach. It's nonlinear. Um, and it's iterative, so it's like the cycle that repeats, and each time you go through this cycle, you go deeper and deeper into building these relationships. So it's a stepwise process of building relationships across cultures. So there's a lot of things that have been happening because of the urgency of the problems that we face. Um, the White House uh, acknowledged that Western science is not enough to give us 
uh, the tools and the insights that we need. And so starting in November of 2021, there was a presidential memorandum about uh, we need to incorporate indigenous knowledge into um, all the decision making as much as possible that agencies make. And now it, uh, this was released in November 22, um, is another presidential memorandum with principles and practices to build and maintain trust to support indigenous knowledge. To create this, what happened was there was a year plus of listening sessions and meetings between the White House staff and indigenous people. And I was involved in some of those. And then the guidance that we provided were incorporated into um, this document and it's freely available online. It's easy to access. Um, just you know, Google it and it'll pop up. Um, and people didn't hold back. And the most beautiful thing is that the resulting presidential memorandum communicates very clearly what some of the key concerns that Native people have. And the, those concerns mainly have to do with exploitation uh, and yet another manifestation of, um, of settler colonialism. So they're very straightforward word. Number one, acknowledge what you did. So acknowledge that the, you're living on stolen land and there was genocide involved. So this, this is, these are not suggestions when you look at this document, it says should. So if you wanna partner with a tribal nation, here's what you should do. And it's directed at heads of agencies, but the instructions are that everything that's in there, all these principles affect anybody that is working with an agency as well with federal funding. So number two, practice early and sustained engagement. So come to, if you wanna partner with a tribal nation, approach them as early as possible. When you just have this seed of an idea in your head about this cool project you wanna do, not when you have it fully formed and your research team all put together and the funding together and then you go to the tribe and say, hey, you know, here's this plan that we have. That doesn't build trust. Earn and maintain trust. That means it's a long process. It can take a couple of years to develop a relationship with a tribal nation to the point that they'll sign on to having a partnership with you. Sometimes more than that. So have patience and determination. And understand, number four, that tribal nations, indigenous people, our worldview is very different from the Western worldview. And respect that. So meet us where we are. Don't expect us to conform to the settler colonial structures that are, are all of our institutions, like academic institutions, federal agencies, are based on that settler colonial structure. Recognize challenges. So understand that just because you are coming to a tribal nation with kindness in your heart, there's a lot of stuff that has happened that hasn't been so good. And so acknowledge that and create that safe space for you know, people to develop trust mutually. It's that reciprocity piece. And more on reciprocity is consider co-management and co-stewardship structures, and Tom Kay talked about that a bit, and so did Tracy Stone Manning this morning. Um, that empowers tribal nations to take control and take action themselves rather than being treated in a trust relationship, um, as is often the case with um, federally funded programs like BIA programs. Um, and then pursue co-production of knowledge. That means that if you write a report, publish a journal article, your co-authors should include members of that tribal nation, like elders, um, the knowledge keepers, natural resource managers, you should ask them who wants to join us in this publication. And then it's co-authored and it, that publication truly reflects your partnership. I'm gonna take you on a two-eyed seeing learning journey. It's my journey. 
Um, so it begins in Waterton Lakes National Park, Alberta, with the Kainai First Nation, who reached out to me and asked me to work on their land, land that had been totally closed off to outside researchers who were not tribal members, even indigenous people like me, for 70 years because of all the exploitation that had taken place on those lands. And I, then I will take you to the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation and describe the work we are doing there. And then I'll introduce our Western Oregon project working on ONC lands in, with tribal nations in Western Oregon. And Allison and Tessa will share with you their ideas and thoughts and where they are because that's what their PhDs are based on is the work on that project. And then we'll have some time for questions. So two-eyed seeing, traditional ecological knowledge, the National Native Seed Strategy, and climate resiliency. And again, when I submitted the ab title and abstract for this, it was before the indigenous knowledge um, directive came through. So I think this is really cool, actually. It just shows you how rapidly things are changing right now. Um, and indigenous knowledge is a more powerful term because it, is, it calls out the indigenous proprietary relationship there. So this is our project in Waterton in a nutshell. Waterton Lakes National Park, Alberta is located um, just north of the US-Canada border, just north of Montana in um, Western Alberta. And the park had been setting these pres large prescribed burns to restore this grassland that had been encroached on by um, mostly aspen and shrubs. And that is because of removal of the bison and removal of cultural burning were the primary factors there. There's a, a huge elk herd there, but the elk were not able to keep up with all of the encroachment. Um, and so the park had been burning you know, this landscape, and we had been studying it. I did this for my PhD work and um, had a long-term project there. And then um, the Kainai reached out to me and asked me if I would work um, in that notch, that little red notch, and that is the Kainai timber limit right next to it. And um, I said yes, not realizing what that invitation meant. It then took almost two years before I had a research permit to work on their land, even with them inviting me. So that's about relationship building because so many terrible things had happened between the Kainai and outside researchers and the federal government. And today the Kainai and the federal government in Canada have this beautiful relationship based on reciprocity and um, to a certain extent it's because I, I was like, the um, connector between them and I helped create that safe space and educate um, the Parks Canada folks who are really good people on how to build these relationships, how to build trust. And, I, and the Kainai trusted me and so I was able to like bring everybody together around the same table to find that common ground. Um, the common ground really, one of the key parts of it is involving tribal youth and making sure that whatever you're doing, most of the funding goes directly into tribal nations rather than you, um, you know, pro progressing professionally and funding people from outside and everything goes out of the community, mm -hmm. right? So these are some of the images from us in the field. And then the, um, so you could see the numbers there on the bottom of what the impacts were, but then the Kenai uh, wildfire, um, exploded. It was the most severe fire that has ever burned in North America in recorded history, the mega fire, and it burned um, Waterton Lakes National Park with, oh, at least 95 percent high severity. So that's never happened before. It was uniform. You can see um, the analysis we did of fire severity, how uniform that fire was. So I was in the field with my crew there then, and we were evacuated twice during that mega fire. So this is what it looked like. That was a dense aspen stand on the left where you see those pin flags. That's what it looked like after the fire. The fire removed up to half a meter of topsoil. Um, but then that's what it looked like, the image on the right, 
just a few months later, three months later in July. So there were these buried seed banks that came up after the fire. It was also a prairie that was composed of, you know, per the data that we had been collecting um, before the Kenai wildfire, 94% of it was native species. And you heard the speakers earlier today talk about the importance of native species. And so the bottom image is the most startling image. Um, that is what came up after the fire. That's Calamagrostis, um, which is a soil stabilizing species. It came up from a buried seed bank. Those seed, recall what Tracy talked about, those buried seed banks. The seed bank was 100 years old. Because I'd been surveying for that plant intensively in the 700 um, vegetation plots I had in that system and only had detected it three times in any plot. And there are historical photographs from 1910 that showed the same phenomenon happening after the 1910 fires. So the earth remembers. In fact, one of the tribal elders I work with said, the land is a memory stick. And this is an example of that. So then um, what happened is Peggy Olwell of BLM joined me in Watertown and said, Christina, we really want to tra partner with tribal nations in the US, but we're not, you know, the, we're having a hard time building trust, even though my botanists are amazing people who are doing everything they can to create a supportive environment. And so she joined me in the field to see what I was doing, how, you know, why things worked so well in Waterton and with the Kainai First Nation. And she was there with us for a week, and then she said, can you do this in Montana? And I am from Montana, and I said, well, yeah, I could, but I don't know how it's going to work because each tribal nation is different, and they'll have different priorities, different cultures, um, what works so well with the Kainai. You know, and she said, well, they're Plains tribes. I said, yes, but every tribe is different. And so um, I, she introduced me to... Um, Wendy Bellman, who is with us today, and she's a Montana Dakota's botanist. And we, you know, this would never have worked without Wendy and Peggy being willing to consider a very different value system and way of partnering. And so they set it up, I wrote a proposal, and they, it was their idea that it be a five-year pilot project so we could figure out what worked best for the tribes. And the results have been pretty amazing. Um, I want to, you can see there's tribal youth, there's uh, community fellowships we provide. Um, you can see what our goals are. And the bottom goal is particularly, sorry, important trying to get this to go back, and it's not now. Can somebody help me? Oh, wait, there. OK. So um, the image on the right, in kind of in the middle, that's Wendy. And this is our first day of the first field season. We started with a ceremony. And Wendy is meeting with Minerva Allen, she is a tribal elder who's in her mid-80s and an ethnobotanist and a published poet, an amazing poet. And Wendy is, um, so cultural humility is, besides reciprocity, that's really what you need to build these relationships. And, you know, I took that picture and it was a candid shot, but that is how Wendy approached Minerva. If Wendy hadn't done that, nothing I would have done would have worked, actually. And so with cultural humility, and what she was doing was um, asking permission. You know, these are the BLM focal species. What do you think of these? Getting her guidance and her blessing. And there were lots of um, tears and hugs involved. So it, that stands out as one of the most memorable moments for me as an ecologist to witness you know, this coming together across cultures with total openness and humility. And Minerva responded with incredible kindness and generosity. 
And so the way things work with a tribal nation is if you connect with an elder like that, that tells the tribal council everything about you. You know, if you connect like that with your heart and with humility. So we created this tribal youth native plant conservation model and it was, um, the work there was featured in a cover story at High Country News. And basically, um, you bring in community fellows, they're well-paid internships for at-risk youth. Um, then after they've completed an internship, you hire them as field techs, you offer them field technician positions at top USGS rates. And then you help create STEM education opportunities for them, like, uh, you know, paid uh, tuition at universities, um, ways for them to move forward on their career. In Waterton, several of the community fellows that I've had, uh, the brevity, I didn't go into detail, but they've completed their master's degrees. And they were highly at-risk high school students when they first joined me, like seniors who were like totally adrift. So it makes a big difference. And you get them out there collecting plants and they go, oh my God, this is so cool. You know, or digging a soil pit to see what's happening with the soil. So, um, so these then become the future Native American natural resource leaders. So you're braiding sweetgrass, bringing together these two cultures. That image, it's Kylie Moore, the reporter from High Country News. And she had just asked me, well, first she wanted to do a story about my project. And I said, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about the community fellows. And then we were in the field and she asked me, can you please explain the methods you're using? I said, well, yes, of course I can. But um, these young women who are community fellows can explain those methods as well as I can. So I put them on the spot. I admit that, but um, those young women gave the most, ex they gave an explanation of the methods that was comparable to what any graduate student would have given because they were that engaged, because these are their traditional lands. So it's just an amazing, amazing process. Here are some of the outcomes for um, Fort Belknap. Uh, we don't have the 2022 outcomes finalized yet. Um, that is what our workspace looks like. It's, you know, even on a day when it's 105 degrees, it's heaven. Um, it's, you know, pretty intact prairie and there's bison there. There's been a bison restoration. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful story. And there's more to this story. So. This is from a 2022 field season, 2021 field season. Um, on BLM land, it was a, a D4 drought, which is an extremely severe drought. Um, on BLM land, it was the drought impacts were so strong that um, nothing germinated really. Very little produced seeds. When there were seed pods, they were hollow. Uh, prairie grasses that are normally two meters tall were like, oh, I don't know, 10 centimeters tall. Okay, right immediately adjacent to that is Fort Belknap Indian community land. And you same, those were taken the same week, those images. Look at the difference. On tribal land, the grasses were up to my shoulders. We collected many pounds of seeds, many pounds of seeds. And um, in the center, that is Alkaline Lake. It is um, a site where there are some very productive um, prairie grasses. Um, and there was, you know, there were all these hollow seed pods. The grasses would have, the stunted grasses started producing um, seeds and then aborted so that the seed pods had no cotyledon. So, we had camera traps and you know, people can look at that and go, well, yeah, of course you have cattle grazing on, on you know, BLM land. Well, the camera traps showed the same amount of cattle grazing on both lands, right? So then for, as an ecologist, for me, it becomes like, well, what the heck is going on here? The plant communities are identical. The slope and aspect is the same. All the ecological conditions are the same. What's different is that 
Um, last summer, I brought in Tom DeLuca joined me as a co-PI. He's an eminent soil ecologist. And what we found was that on tribal land, there was pyrogenic carbon. And that is um, carbon that comes up is produced during a fire and during these cultural, frequent cultural burns. And now there's new data that has come out from Oregon State University researchers that show that these cultural burns were as frequent as every one to six years. So the um, pyrogenic carbon, it stays in the soil for up to 5,000 years. It's the most stable carbon sink and it increases the nitrogen cycle so it increases greatly the flow of nutrients in the soil. So now we're taking a very deep look at this. And there's Tom DeLuca with one of the um, former community um, fellows, um, Savannah Spotted Bird, who is now, um, she's now a program coordinator on that project. And she started college. So um, this, is, this is an evolving thing. So but the next thing is that you know, these are the things you have to be mindful of at every step in this to, to have these relationships. To, to find that common ground, and that is a petroglyph, a rock with, um, with you know, carvings that are very, it's a spiritual site. And they brought us there to collect seeds. And, you know, because we had fulfilled the conditions that are necessary to build that trust. And, you know, I, I don't have time to go into each of these. We talked about some of this in the workshop, that the two workshops that we held yesterday. Um, bottom image is Roz Lapeer, who is also an eminent ethnobotanist, and she's Blackfoot, and she joined us in the field, and there's Wendy Wellman, and they had these amazing conversations across cultures. So it takes a village. Meanwhile, this is what was happening in Oregon, this um, 2020, 2021, the 2020 Labor Day fires. So when um, Peggy said, we're interested in having you replicate the work you're doing in Fort Belknap because it's working so well and we want to build other tribal partnerships, where, what areas do you think really could use, um, you know, where there's a gap in native plant material collections and there's, you know, there's opportunities to build tribal partnerships. And I said, it took me two seconds to say, well, Oregon, and I wasn't working at Oregon State University back then, um, but I had gotten my PhD there. And so I was familiar with the challenges in those fire prone forests. So um, we received funding for a five year pilot study and three-year pilot study there, I'm working on the ONC lands. Those are those orange triangles on the left. And more specifically, the instructions that I've received recently from BLM uh, leadership in the state and the district offices is they want us to focus on the sites of those Labor Day fires and do an as ecological assessment of sites in there um, look for the plant material that's coming up. And remember um, what Tom K mentioned is that when you're dealing with these very stress degraded sites, you do want to collect plant materials there because those are the survivors and the ones that are most adapted. So that's the work we're just starting. And here is an overview of that project. It is also involving many, many tribal youth the five Western tribes of Oregon. Um, our goals are very similar to the goals we had in Fort Belknap, except this is a forested landscape. And it is about finding that common ground across cultures. So one of the uh, members of one of the tribes there, the uh, Siti Kusi, as we call them for short, it's a confederate tribes of Sayus, the lower Amqua uh, tribes. Uh, when their natural resource director is uh, now my graduate student, and she's one of the top ethnobotanists in Oregon. And so that's an example of the trust. And it's because of these stories. So the tribes in Oregon have heard the stories about the work in, in Montana and the work in, in Canada and in Indian country where travels and, you know, I consider myself, yes, I'm the principal investigator on these projects, but I just consider myself a helper 
It helps build these relationships because there's no way that any one person could do this on their own without having those relationships across cultures and without having amazing partners, such as in Montana, we have, um, I mean, in Oregon, we have Abe Wheeler and Sarah Canham, who's the Pacific Northwest a botanist for BLM, and she's with us today. And they're such lovely human beings who really want to build these partnerships. And so they're open, you know, rather than push back, like, why does it take so long? Or why do we have to do this? They go, great, let's do it. So for me, it's a dream. And the other part of this dream is having students like Tessa and Allison who really embody um, these allyships across cultures. So Allison is Native American and Tessa is not, and they are, they've become best friends in the traditional ecological knowledge lab where, that I founded at Oregon State. So diversity in the forests of the future, these are these overstocked, even aged forests that historically never looked like this because Native people burned them. Cultural burning was um, quite frequent and fire return intervals of one to six years in those, some of those forests. So we, we need to rethink how we manage ecosystems, whether it's a grassland or a forest, in order to avoid you know, more of these, these fires, these mega fires from burning everything up. Finally, I want to point out the two uh, young women on the right-hand side. One is a community fellow. She's 13 years old. Her name is, is she, her, her name is Monroe. And the other one um, is a young woman who had joined my project as, in, as a community fellow, and then I hired her as a technician. And she is now um, finished her bachelor's degree in natural resources and is on the tribal council and got one of the most um, prestigious fellowships that the Canadian government gives for climate change adaptation. That's what I mean about leaders of the future. Um, Monroe Fox is actually going to start at Oregon State University next fall term. She has completed one year of her bachelor's degree and she said, her goal in life, besides being a good ancestor, is to become a botanist and get a PhD in botany and work with seeds. So there you go. Um, this is how it starts, and I have a lot of hope. OCO, Allison Monroe, Dawado, Wado, Christina. Um, hello, my name is Allison Monroe, and thank you, Christina, for such a beautiful presentation and opening up this conversation. Um, I am a PhD student in the Traditional Ecological Knowledge Lab and an NSF Graduate Research Fellow, but most importantly, I am a mixed Indigenous scholar. I am of Cherokee and settler descent, and I bring both of those perspectives into the research that I do, and that's what I'm going to be talking about with you all today. So a quick overview of my education. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Biology from Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. Uh, where I also studied philosophy and creative writing. I'm a, a true liberal arts student. Um, I, after that, I was awarded a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, where I studied community-based insect conservation with indigenous groups across the globe. Um, following that, I, did a, I started a master's at the University of Montana in environmental studies, working with Rosalind LaPierre to study indigenous knowledge and environmental sustainability. But after about a year in that program, um, I found out I had been awarded this NSF fellowship and that Roslyn was leaving that institution and suddenly was at an institution that didn't necessarily have the capacity for the kind of research that I needed to be doing. So coincidentally, that lined up with an internship with Christina at the Fort Belknap Indian community. And I was so impressed and moved by the work that was being done there that was so in line with the work that I had applied to do that 
things were put in motion and I transferred to Oregon State University uh, where I'm now working on my dissertation. So I have extensive experience working with indigenous communities and in insect conservation around the world, um, as well as in Arkansas where I'm from and where I went to college. Uh, I've worked with many renowned entomologists, but across the board, the most important thing to me is finding ways to uplift indigenous knowledge holders and finding ways to innovatively, you know, lift them up and bring their knowledge into conservation practices. So one example stands out really poignantly, and I think um, cultural humility can be a hard concept for us to grasp. So I will share my best example <laughs> with you. Um, so my first stop on my Watson Fellowship was in the Mashwala Peninsula of Madagascar, which is right outside of Mashwala National Park. It's in the northeastern part of Madagascar. And my project there was to work with a traditional food, which is an insect called secundri. It's the bottom image on this slide. And they're very delicious. They taste just like bacon, I promise. Um, and uh, I, you know, you make a plan and it's all supposed to work out and go to the plan and you, you know, do the research proposal. The idea was that I would go and I would study this insect, you know, study their life history, describe the species and describe the host plant. Um, but uh, I, my translator never showed up and uh, that was the first issue. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> I could tell endless stories about my experiences in Madagascar, but I think one of the most important lessons that I learned was admitting my naivety and ignorance. So within about the first week, I pretty quickly realized that I had generally no idea how to exist in this space. Um, there was no electricity, no running water. Uh, um, it was very different from how we live life in the United States. And uh, the, I didn't know much of the language because they speak a different dialect of Malagasy in the Northeastern region. And uh, I pretty much, the only way that I could communicate how little I knew was learning the word for an infant, like a newborn child, and saying that that was me over and over again to the woman I was living with. And she died laughing and then took me around the village and you know, introduced everyone to me. I, I was her new child, you know? And uh, I, I think about that a lot because, you know, I think that it's really important to understand where you're coming from and, and how little you know about situations. And that was kind of a dramatic example, but um, I really didn't know anything. And, and that opened up a lot of doors for me. Um, all of the women in the village then immediately started teaching me words. The men started taking me out on hikes into the forests. Um, and yeah, that, that brings us to the second point. Um, it's essential to ask questions rather than make assumptions when you're in a new culture. So, uh, it, after about a month living in Madagascar, I asked Delox, who became a close friend and is the equivalent of like a chief of the village I was in. Um, and I asked him all of these questions I'm supposed to be researching about this traditional food, right? And he laughed pretty hard and knew all of them, right? He, all of the answers to these questions, clearly. And this insect is supposed to have been like elusive and they can't find the host plant and it's difficult to find. Uh, but yeah, he laughed and then he took a minute and he told me no one had ever asked them that. You know, none of the researchers like take time to ask the community members if they already know the answers to these questions. Um, and that happened a couple different times <laughs> while I was there. So yeah, I think overall it's also deeply important to listen with an open mind and open heart, which I think, you know, we don't talk about that often in science, but I think it really is essential when we think about cultural humility. Um, it takes time to build relationships and to build trust. And I think, you know, one indigenous person I was working with told me trust is earned in teaspoons and lost in tablespoons. So listening really intentionally and remembering what people tell you, remembering the stories they tell you, and the honor that it is when they do share stories with you is really essential. So now I'll move more into the academic realm of what I've learned about designing research so that you can partner with tribal nations. 
So if I can impart one thing to you today, like one bit of knowledge, I hope it's that traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge is not the same thing as superstition. I think that this is a relatively common misconception that people may have, even if it's a subconscious bias that we may have. Um, and I just wanna address that and we'll build on it a little bit more. So traditional ecological knowledge, Robin Wall Kimmerer defines it as knowledge and practices passed orally from generation to generation, informed by strong cultural memories, sensitivity to change, and values that include reciprocity. Whereas superstition is defined as a belief or way of behaving that is based on fear of the unknown and faith in magic or luck. So now that we know and accept that, <laughs> we can start to think about paradigms. So paradigms explain how we look at reality and how we interact with reality, right? So if we accept that TEK is more than superstition and it is a way of knowing it's an entire paradigm, then we can start to understand how it's built differently. So I like to think of paradigms as a tree. Paradigms are made up of questions around ontology, epistemology, methodologies, and axiologies. And I'm not gonna go into a whole like lecture about that, but basically, Ontologies help us ask questions about what exists. So that's the root of our knowledge system. Epistemology or epistemological questions help us ask how do we know whether or not something exists? And that's like the trunk. It gives a lot of support to the ideas that we're gonna develop. Methodologies help us answer questions like how do we investigate existence? Now that we're asking questions of existence, now how do we investigate it? And then moving up into what would be like the fruit or the, you know, the, the top of the tree, we can start to think about axiologies. So now that we know and accept things exist, how do we value those things? Value systems start to come out once we understand these other parts of a paradigm. So Sean Wilson is an indigenous scholar who's done really incredible work, and I highly recommend this book if you're interested in more about research, indigenous research paradigms. But I think two really important pillars of indigenous research paradigms are relationality and relational accountability. So when we're designing research projects, we need to keep these differences and ways of knowing in mind. Relationality relates to those questions of ontology and epistemology, so questions like what exists and how do we know that it exists. And relationality is defined as relationships shaping reality. They, they don't shape reality, they are reality, right? And you can read more about this in his book. And relational accountability then brings us into those questions around methodologies and axiologies. And in Western science, a lot of times the value of our research projects is based in the questions that we're asking and the impact of those questions. But in indigenous research, the value is in relationships themselves and your accountability to those relationships, whether that's to people or other kin who are non-human. I also think it's important to note that there are some similarities in some of these ways of knowing that we might already have knowledge of. So Robin Wall Kimmerer defines the honorable harvest as taking only what's given, using it well, and being grateful for the gift and reciprocating that gift back. In Sand County Almanac, Aldo Leopold describes the land ethic as relationships between people and land that are intertwined and that care for people cannot be separated from the care for the land. And I think that you know Aldo Leopold is often lauded as one of the founders of modern conservation. And so I think the land ethic might present a really interesting opportunity for us to start thinking about how Western paradigms might not only already include some aspects of relationships, but how we can begin to change Western paradigms. So now, how does all of that relate to the work that I'm gonna be doing on insects and also to seed collection and restoration? Now that we understand some of the value differences or we can start to get an idea of how value differences might start to arise, uh, we can start to think about how these research topics or just topics in general might differ across cultures. So insects in general are valued really differently in indigenous cultures than in Western cultures. A lot of times in Western science and in Western culture, insects are seen as some kind of pest um, and, you know, the lethal collection is pretty accepted with them because they reproduce quickly. So it's kind of dismissive of the value of the individual lives of the insects. 
Whereas in indigenous epistemologies, insects are really essential parts of not only the continuation and relationships of the natural world, but also members of the creation stories, members of the first fire story, the Cherokee first fire story, water spider, who's not an insect, but you know, a mini legged creature is really essential to bringing the fire back to the animal people from the great sycamore tree. So um, in the work that I've done in the Great Plains, when I first told uh, some of the elders that I work with insects, I remember <laughs> one of the elders saying, oh my gosh, my grandpa always used to tell me grasshoppers are good medicine, grasshoppers are good medicine. And I think about that a lot, um, that I think insects present a really interesting disconnect between Western science and indigenous science because there are such drastic negative associations with insects in the Western world. We can also think about value differences with pollinators more specifically. If we accept that seeds are sacred in indigenous cultures and we understand as Western scientists that pollinators are essential in the creation of seeds, you might be able to begin to put together why pollinators might be so important in indigenous cultures. In some indigenous cultures, pollinators are symbols of fertility or reproduction more broadly, and um, they play a really important role in this transmission of not just knowledge, but the continuation of relationships between flowers. And we can tie that back to our ideas that I mentioned earlier of relationality and relational accountability. So my study more specifically on native plants, pollinators, and soils at OSU, I'm working really hard to braid sweetgrass like everyone else in our lab and everyone else doing this kind of work. And I think it's really important to note that when we're braiding sweetgrass, we're not pulling apart the different strands. We're trying to braid them together to create something stronger. So we're uplifting many ways of knowing rather than taking and choosing what we want. This brings us to a systems approach too and understanding how the ecological studies you know, that I'm doing are more than just drawing lines through a food web or writing down formulas for a model. They're building relationships and understanding relationships and investing in those relationships for the long term. Relationships are really important if you couldn't tell and they guide our sampling methods too. So with my specific methods, um, I am trying to prioritize values that fit into both indigenous research paradigms and Western science paradigms. And this presents particularly large challenges with entomology because the standard is lethal collection and like I mentioned, kind of disregarding the individual lives of these insects. And so uh, we're exploring some really exciting non-lethal options such as environmental DNA, eDNA analyses and insect camera trap methods um, and other things like that, and we're really excited about it. So, yeah, that's it. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tessa Chisonis. Um, I am, again, a current PhD student uh, in the College of Forestry at Oregon State University also a member of the Traditional Ecological Knowledge Lab um, with Christina. And for my talk today, I'm gonna to be talking about my experiences with TEK and ecocultural restoration. And rather than going into a lot of project specifics, I'm instead gonna talk about uh, lessons that I have learned uh, as a non-Indigenous person who is partnering with tribal nations. So a little bit more about me. My background is mainly in wildlife science. I got my bachelor's at NC State University in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. And then I got my master's at the University of Southampton, also in wildlife conservation. Uh, after that, I spent a few years uh, working as a wildlife technician, mainly for a company called Tetra Tech, where I was investigating migratory tree bat roosting habits in Montana. And then most recently, um, after meeting Christina, I served as her co-lead field technician for the BLM Fort Belknap uh, grassland restoration project. Um, as you can see, there's not a lot of tribal partnerships in my past experiences, and that's because before I met Christina, I really hadn't heard of TEK before. Um, so once she started teaching me about uh, indigenous knowledge and perspectives, it just immediately resonated with me, and I became really passionate about partnering with tribal nations, uh, not only to promote social justice, but just to find more holistic ways to manage our ecosystems in general. 
So like I said, I am a non-Indigenous person who comes from white privilege. I've been really fortunate enough to travel around the world for different research opportunities, uh, ma mainly Africa. Um, so I've been around Indigenous communities in general, but this was a really filtered experience, right? I was always an outsider in these cases. So before beginning my work in Fort Belknap, I really needed to first decolonize myself in a way. I traditionally was a classically trained Western scientist, so I had a lot of concepts like science is objective, science is concrete, humans exist outside of nature, and that's the most effective way to manage our ecosystems. A lot of those kind of concepts were ingrained in me early on in my academic career, and they all also directly contradict with an indigenous perspective. So I really dove headfirst into educating myself about indigenous knowledges, indigenous histories, um, and I started to notice how much of today's society is still rooted in colonialism. And I think it's really important for any non-indigenous person who's hoping to partner with tribal nations to first recognize this fact and then start to question some of these colonial-based knowledge systems that are still in place. Um, I also wanted to put up these books as recommendations. I highly recommend them for anyone who's starting out this journey. I thought they provided a really great baseline for what TEK is and how to move forward from there. So now moving on to specific things I learned while in Fort Belknap. Um, I won't go into the project specifics because Christina did such a nice job with that, but I will say everything I learned was based in the concepts of respect, reciprocity, and humility. Um, there's also no single best approach, like Christina said. You know, I learned that every tribe has their own unique TEK, and this is something you need to be mindful of moving forward as you're establishing these different partnerships. So first and foremost, building trust is super important, especially as a non-Indigenous person who's coming into these communities. Um, apologies for the slight overlap here with Christina's, but these are really important points to remember here. Um, first, acknowledging past and current injustices is extremely important. We can't move forward unless we first acknowledge the past. Second, being patient. These kind of relationships are gonna take time and not get, they're not gonna happen overnight. So you need to be willing and prepared to have maybe a later start time uh, for your project than you were anticipating. I also cannot stress enough the importance of practicing humility and listening if someone is willing to share their knowledge with you. I learned so much by just sitting back, not interrupting, and listening, especially because storytelling is such a prominent component of indigenous cultures. Um, so you really essentially need to check your ego at the door and kind of admit the fact that you don't know everything. Open communication is also super important in general, but especially when you're partnering with tribal nations. You need to be honest about you know, where you're going, when you're going there, what you're doing there, what you're sampling, are you bringing any samples back with you? These kinds of things need to be communicated with the tribes beforehand, otherwise you run the risk of breaking that trust that you're trying to establish. And then just respecting different perspectives. Uh, indigenous and Western viewpoints differ in a lot of ways, and if you can't respect that fact, you're not gonna have a solid foundation with which to build that partnership on. Next, I learned the importance of community engagement. Um, including tribal members in every single part of the process is super important. So from your initial planning stages, opening up a discussion with the tribe about their desires and their priorities and letting that inform your methodologies. Um, also including tribal members in the data collection process all the way up through publication and providing co-authorship opportunities for indigenous knowledge holders is super important because it's all about giving credit where credit is due. Also, it's not just about engaging the community throughout the whole process, it's about engaging the whole community period. So from tribal youth all the way, till the elder, all the way up to the elders. Um, I spent most of my time with a lot of the young adults who were working as technicians, and I can say that I relied on their knowledge frequently in the field because they understand that landscape so much more than I ever will, and that's it a really important thing to respect and remember. Um, this is an equal partnership, so you want to avoid any of those power imbalances, and I think a great way to do that is by actively engaging the whole community throughout the process. Next, I wanted to touch on reciprocity because it is a core value of TEK and it's incorporated into everything that we do on the project. Now, I know reciprocity is probably not a new idea to most of you here, 
But what was new to me was the way reciprocity is realized in indigenous communities. I always associated reciprocity, reciprocity to be with how you interact with other people. But from an indigenous perspective, it's not only how you're interacting with other people, but how you're interacting with the land as well. So we would do things on our project like avoiding oversampling seed populations, minimizing our impact to the land. For example, when we're digging soil pits out in a plot, um, carefully removing the top layer, setting it aside, and then when we're ready to fill it back in, laying it on top to make it look like we were never there in the first place. Also, uh, something that was new to me was giving thanks by leaving tobacco offerings. Um, this is something we did every time we were out in the field, but especially any time we took any collections home with us. But we did uh, consult with the tribal council and elders before doing this because we needed to make sure that it was appropriate and was honoring the th their cultural traditions. Uh, when it comes to reciprocity with each other, this manifested itself in a lot of different ways on our project. We had a lot of shared meals with different community members and this was a really wonderful way for me to get to know them, but more importantly for them to get to know me, to see that I could be a person that could build that trusting relationship with. Also, we provided our field crews with locally sourced traditional foods to just further support those communities. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention the thoughtful gifting as a way to show your appreciation. Now, I am not at all saying you need to go out and buy some big fancy gift and then boom, you're in. Don't do that, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about something that you, know, you put a lot of thought into or that means something to you to just say, hey, I respect and value the wisdom that you're sharing with me and I really appreciate that you're taking the time to do so. It's all about these reciprocal relationships, right? Both with the community and with the land. And these are just examples from our project. You can find your own ways to show support, the, show support for the community and um, show your appreciation, but I just wanted to include these examples because it shows how TEK not only informs the methodology of our project and the way we collect our data, it also informs just our project culture in general, which is something that was new to me and I hadn't seen a lot before on other research projects. So next I'm gonna talk about some potential challenges, the first one being skepticism as a non-Indigenous person. Um, to me, this is completely justified, and really the only way you can overcome this, I think, is by building that trust, which is gonna take time. Also, the importance of flexibility. Anyone out there who does field work knows how important being flexible is, especially for things like unpredictable weather patterns or equipment malfunctions, but here I'm talking about flexibility from a cultural perspective. So this means giving extra days off for your technicians, for ceremonies, accepting the fact that um, you might have restricted or no access to certain sites due to their cultural significance. Also, it's really important when you first go out to a site before you do any data collection that you're surveying the area because we had several unexpected discoveries sometimes when we would go out to try and establish an aim plot and then we'd actually discover it was an archeological site. So being mindful of these things before you start conducting your research is really important. Also, data sovereignty rights are extremely, extremely important and need to be upheld by everyone at all times on your projects. So any data collected on tribal lands belongs to the tribe, which means things like the whereabouts of culturally significant species or culturally significant sites might have to be omitted from any potential deliverables that you're uh, publishing. Also, communicating how you will manage and store your data is really important because a lot of things that are uploaded to a cloud-based server uh, still are at risk, a security risk, because they can be hacked. So it's really important for you to be upfront with how you're storing your data, um, how you're planning to manage it, to make sure that the tribes are comfortable with what you're doing. I know in Fort Belknap we address this by using paper data sheets instead of using the digital data sheets, so it can just be things of that nature. So, uh, similar work coming up in Oregon as part of our, uh, my PhD, we're gonna be implementing a similar ecocultural restoration and seeds of success project in Oregon. Um, working with BLM, OSU, and Oregon Tribal Nations. Um, the methods and project culture will again be formed by indigenous knowledge, and it's gonna serve to empower those indigenous communities through engagement. 
More specifically to me, I plan to investigate how indigenous land care practices influence mammal community composition and diversity within Western Oregon forests. And the Seeds, Seeds of Success program is gonna play a really big role in this because they heavily contribute to the restoration of native plant communities, which in turn is going to affect you know, wildlife habitat. It's a cyclical, pro sorry, a cyclical process. Um, and a lot of my methodologies will be decolonized. So my study sites and my focal species will all be guided by tribal priorities. We're gonna be hiring indigenous technicians. Um, I'll be using only non-invasive sampling methods to assess the mammal communities. So things like camera traps and eDNA versus uh, live trapping or collaring and upholding data sovereignty rights. So for me, a lot of camera trap management softwares are all cloud-based. So just being mindful of that and choosing the right way to manage my data, um, omitting any culturally sensitive information that the tribes aren't comfortable with, and you know, co-producing any publications with indigenous knowledge holders that, are, that I will be partnering with. Um, I will say this project is still very much in the early stages of development, so there are still some uncertainties out there, um, but really the goal is to develop a two-eyed seeing approach and kind of explore the potential benefits of moving away from a westernized approach to restoration and conservation. And that's it for me, thanks. <laughs> So we will now open it up for questions, and myself and Shannon will be around with the mic. Um, so if you have any questions for the panel, raise your hand, and either one of us will be walking around. Thank you for that talk, very nice. Um, John Clock, I am with Sarah, I'm the district botanist in the BLM in Salem, Oregon. Um, the question I have is, I don't even know how to begin to decolonize. And I learned some things here, but um, it's very difficult. So, um, especially with respect to my work, thanks. Well, that you ask that question means that you're already beginning to decolonize. So that is that openness and cultural humility, and that's how it begins. And if you recall the story that Allison told about her time in Madagascar, it's that when you come to that point of saying, I don't know anything, can you teach me? That's when things start happening. So I mentioned I have a PhD, a master's student who is the, um, an ethnobotanist and a member of one of the tribal nations in Oregon. I was in the field with her the first time I met her and some other people from her community, other leaders in her community. And I went uh, into this, uh, some, one of the former BLM lands that had been um, given as part of legislation that occurred in 2018 uh, to the Siti community. And I said to her, you know, it was amazing what was going on there because they'd done some uh, restoration work. And I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but all of these plants were coming up from buried seed banks. They'd removed some of the conifers um, very carefully. And I said to her, I need you to teach me because I don't know anything. These are your ancestral lands. And then she said, I need you to teach me. So there's that reciprocity piece, right? And so we're learning together. And thank you for asking that question because that's how it starts. So, yes. Okay. Um, I, oh, sorry, over here. Oh, oh sorry. Here. I'll stand up. Um, I'm gonna try to form my question as it comes out of my mouth, so we'll see how this goes. Um, you just mentioned reciprocity, and I, 
I guess I'm wondering for each of these three projects that you mentioned and maybe others, um, are there cases though where I could imagine they might not feel that you are bringing something necessarily to them, right? Like I can see the benefit of, as a non-Indigenous person going in and wanting to, to work with a tribal member to gain knowledge and to learn um, and to potentially collect data, let's say all sorts of different things. Um, or, um, but I could imagine there could also be cases, right, where it's not clear what the reciprocity is of what they are gaining. In this case, there's also the training, right, and there's some clear, um, particular expertise that you're bringing in. Um, but in certain cases, that's not gonna be the case, right, where they already have that knowledge um, within their community already. And so, um, are there ways to engage, to create those partnerships, to expand so that you can, there's the receiving of knowledge um, in one direction, but what is, I guess, what does that reciprocity look like if the community already has maybe the knowledge base that you might have, but you still wanna kind of create relationships to, to build partnerships? Um, yeah. So I'm gonna start, and then I'm gonna ask Allison to chime in as an indigenous person. The reciprocity is quite, it's like an ecosystem all to itself, that concept. It's not simply about knowledge exchange that's mutually beneficial. It's not simply about creating jobs in indigenous communities or education opportunities. Um, yes, the federal government leadership has recognized that we need indigenous knowledge in order to heal the damage done to landscapes and you know, life on the planet because of climate change and settler, anthropogenic climate change and settler colonialism. But the reciprocity piece is not just about that exchange of knowledge, it's about the seventh generation principle. So what you, every action that you take right now is affecting, you know, seven generations is about 140 years into the future. And so, and there are other layers to it beyond that. So to decolonize that reciprocity piece, um, to get beyond things that have value in the Western world, such as data, such as um, prescriptive treatments, you know, all those things have some form of economic value. So to get beyond economics and look at what are the different forms of reciprocity there. Allison, do you want to add something? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll pose a question in return a bit. I think um, it's really important to uh, remember that like tribal nations and indigenous people are sovereign entities. So when we're asking questions about like, oh, um, how, how can we contribute to their knowledge base? I would treat it the same as you would of like partnering with another national entity, right? So like if, if that entity already had that, you need to come at it with that level of respect and, and like understanding that the knowledge exchange is gonna, I don't know if I'm wording this very well. Um, Yeah, if, if you, I guess really thinking about if you do have um, something to add, if, if they are like a separate sovereign entity, um, is it, yeah, is it uh, worthy of like, you know, that? We have time for probably one more question. Oh, go ahead. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have. Just a real quick question, so maybe you'll have time for another. Um, just curious, I heard two of you mention um, collaborating and co-authoring reports with tribal members. And if you're comfortable, I was curious if you could share any examples of what types of reports that you guys have co-authored. Yeah, so for example, um, with the Kainai First Nations, I wrote a, um, peer-reviewed, I was the lead author of a peer-reviewed journal article, um, and it was published in a very prominent journal about uh, the impacts of that fire. And the co-authors, from the beginning I had of having this idea of writing this article, my idea was to braid some sweetgrass. So what I did was the co-authors of that manuscript 
And I'm hoping this happens in Oregon, actually, with the work we're doing there. Um, the co-authors were um, tribal elders, tribal land managers, um, Parks Canada, the chief scientist in the park, their fire manager. Um, there were about, I think, maybe nine co-authors in all, uh, very highly regarded Western scientists who were um, fire ecologist experts. And we all got together and worked on this manuscript together. And it was this incredibly beautiful experience. Um, the federal authors had to have um, Ottawa, you know, headquarters of Parks Canada approve their contribution. It took three days, which is unheard of, right? And same, the tribal council um, and the tribal culture officer had to approve the manuscript. That took like a day. Um, and it was just this very happy, natural process built on trust. So we, this is what we hope to be replicating with the work that we're doing in the US. Thank you for what you've said. I just want to share um, a offering. Uh, in one of the slides, there was uh, wonderful quotes from Aldo Leopold and Robin Wall Kimmerer. And for those of you that don't know, earlier this year, just a few weeks ago, uh, the Aldo Leopold Foundation had its Leopold Week, and they invited Robin Wall Kimmerer to speak. And she gave what I thought was very eloquent and powerful. And I've heard her speak a lot. And this one I thought was particularly good in terms of uh, how to step up and really walk the walk in terms of how we uh, repair damage relationships to the land and to each other. And so uh, it's available online, so I hope you have an opportunity to go and look at it at the Aldo Leopold Foundation, Leopold Week 2023, Robin Wall Kimmer's talk. Thank you for that recommendation, and I was aware that she was giving that talk, so I look forward to watching it. Um, we have about a couple minutes until a break. Um, if you all don't mind staying up there, maybe a couple minutes after, um, we will likely have time for one one more question. It's one thing Tessa said about thoughtful gifting made me think about this, and it's a personal example of it. Um, most of my life living with my mother. We had to move off of my tribe's land for her to be able to pursue higher education and a uh, career. And more recently, moving back, I've really been trying to learn more about my tribe's culture and participate in ceremonies. And there's been one man that has really uh, been a mentor for me and has helped me a lot. And just last week, I gifted him a jar of maple syrup that my family collects and boils ourselves. That's beautiful. How do you all feel up there? Would you like to answer some more questions? Yeah, okay. Who's next? Yeah, thank you for your talks. James Gatsky, uh, I'm gonna, <coughs> excuse me an employee of the Washer Tribe of Nevada and California. And uh, right now, it seems like an exciting time of change and oppor new opportunities for tribal nations. And I was wondering, wanted to get some ideas from you in terms of how do we sustain this into the future? How do we keep these policies going in the right direction, funding, et cetera? And just was wondering. Well, um that presidential memorandum that I mentioned is part of how we do that, and that is being um, acted on by, I work very closely with the Forest Service as well, and with Fish and Wildlife Service, and all the federal agencies are embedding those, they're called principles, and then after the principles come the practices. So this is 
The hope is that these be formalized so they're part of our culture, uh, not my culture, your culture, those of you who work for government agencies. They're also part of our culture, those of us who work for academic institutions, like Oregon State is an R1 university, and it is the second greatest uh, college of forestry in the world. The top rated one is in Sweden. And so we don't have any principles and practices that are formal about how to partner with tribal nations. And if as, you know, the College of Forestry and the university doesn't have that, then how the heck are we gonna do this? So that gets to the longevity, right? The other, um, there's a couple other important pieces with regard to native plant conservation and restoration. We need botanists. We need to bring in, um, Bill, remember the to story I told you about Monroe Fox, who now wants to get her PhD in botany, and she's gonna do it, and she is gonna, she is already amazing. But, so we need to build that kind of capacity with tribal nations, that is that the seventh generation approach. We need dedicated funding for partnerships with tribal nations. I've been very fortunate that um, the program, the Seeds of Success program that I work with has wanted to invest. From day one, when um, Peggy first started talking to me, I said, this is gonna cost money. I said, it takes money and patience and time to partner with tribal nations. So, so having that, building the capacity internally within um, government institutions, agencies, to then build the capacity within tribes, and that's that reciprocity piece, right? So those are some ideas. Um, I have a lot of faith that things are happening so rapidly at the federal level that there are some changes that are being implemented pretty rapidly to take that seventh generation approach to having these partnerships and, and working across cultures as well with academic institutions that have great longevity as well. So it takes all of us, brave, we're braiding sweetgrass together, right? I think I saw one more hand over here. Yes. Thank you. This is actually a really nice segue from what you just said, I believe. Uh, this pertains a little bit more to your talk yesterday, but it has to do with paradigms. And I'm wondering if you could speak to why it is that these shifts are happening where indigenous and tribal cultures globally, uh, the voices and perspectives are being more recognized, more appreciated, and even like the IPPS report had the whole section about recognizing indigenous knowledge for conservation. And not only why, but how can we sustain that and develop it and deepen it further? Thank you so much. Well, one name comes to mind, and that's Secretary Halland. And uh, I don't like to get political, but we have a president right now who listens to what she has to say. Secretary Halland is a single mom, lived in poverty for many years, is a lawyer, and in putting her in that position of power that he did, Biden empowered her and then he followed through. Um, and I've also seen that every, um, so I have a policy background. I've done quite a bit of policy work actually. I've seen that um, every, every recommendation that tribal nations make ends up in you know, being put into presidential orders or memoranda. And the National Congress of American Indians, if you look at some of those presidential memoranda, they're like, almost cut and pasted out of those. So we have a voice right now as Native people, um, but really, you know, having her as a Secretary of the Interior has been a huge, has really made that shift go, you know, be much more profound and much more rapid. And I am not privy to, you know, the long-term plans, but I do know that 
things that we're doing now. Um, I'm one of the people that the White House reaches out to and um, agency leaders reach out to to help those practices become a lot more established. So I'm working with the Forest Service as well on bringing indigenous knowledge soundly into any revisions uh, that are um, coming up of the National Forest Management Plan and the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest Management Plan as well. And that's, I'll be doing some of that work next month. So there's profound changes happening right now. And again, much of it is driven by Secretary Halland or inspired by her and the people, the community, and the culture that she's built in Washington, D.C. I believe we will have to end there to give folks time to switch rooms. Um, but thank you again, Christina, Allison, and Tessa. Thank you.